So welcome everybody to today's seminar given by our own Yingji Yang. Um, Yingji came to Macquarie University in 2010 and his interests lie in the dynamics and deformation of Earth's atmosphere and mantle. And in this presentation, um, he shows the multi-scale seismic imaging of subsurface structures using background noise. Okay, Yingji, you can begin now. Okay, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. So, good afternoon, everyone. And today I'm going to present some work I'm working on in the past uh, few years, mostly focused on the uh, size imaging of the subsurface structure using a methodology I call the ambient noise uh, tomography. So, my research background is mostly in uh, seismology. I, my research uh, uh, consists mostly two parts. The one part I, I work on development of the new imaging capability developed in the technology, try to look into the Earth's interior with uh, try to uh, look at a, a finer and a finer scale structure of the Earth. And the second part of my research is using the developed, uh, development methodology to, to uh, solve, address the different uh, geology and environmental problems. So here, Today, I'm mostly focused on this uh, one particular method we call ambient noise tomography. And uh, in the first part, I will introduce the, the, the uh, physical and uh, background for this method. And the second part, I will introduce you all different kinds of application I did in the past few years. So most of the work are done by my PhD student and, uh, and the postdoc and some visitors. So, as we know, our Earth is not a static uh, planet, it's a dynamic Earth with all kinds of convection going on inside the Earth, with, especially with the big subduction in the uh, uh, change beneath the oceans, which creates the volcano and the earthquake. Also, we have the hot material upwelling beneath the ocean ridge, generates the new oceanic plates. So with this uh, dynamic uh, planet, we we, in order to understand all different features that we observed on the surface, we want to also know the internal structure related to that. So, for example, uh, one good example is how we how the uh, collision between India and the Eurasian can create the big the uh, plateau like a Tibet plateau. What is the uh, underlying structure responding for this uh, 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 creation of big plateau? So, I will talk a, a little bit about that in later on in the application of the methodology. So we, the methodology we use to image the internal structure of Earth, find the different kinds of features that relate to the different structure we using seismic uh, tomography method. Here, actually, I first want to show you one, one example of the image. This is the uh, seismic image. Uh, this is called P-wave tomography. Show the structure of the subduction zone beneath the Tonga feet arc here. So, in this image, we show you the different colors. The cold color represents the high seismic velocity and the low, red color represents the low velocity. Because seismic velocity are very sensitive to the uh, temperature inside the Earth. So by looking at this image, we see this uh, high velocity correspond to the lower temperature and, uh, and uh, the red color represents the air with the lower velocity means uh, uh, higher temperature. Also could it mean, could it be, meaning the present of the uh, magma melt inside the earth. And the, so the, we, when we look at this, we can see a lot of features related to the subduction zone, which help us understand the occurrence of earthquake. So here we can see there's a, very, a bunch of the earthquake here, which small circles here show the location of the earthquake and the depths of earthquake associated with this uh, uh, oceanic slab. Okay, so as I mentioned, the seismic tomography is the method used to image the Earth's interior, which is very similar to the CT scan used in the medicine. In the medicine, we're using the X-ray, which can um, uh, penetrate through the body of the humans. And then with the uh, signal coming from different angles, because when we do the CT scan, we have the source rotate along the bodies. So we have the source coming from all different directions. So we, use, we can use the computer program to image the internal structure based on the observation rate of X-ray. 
different parts of the organs can absorb the such the X-ray with different rates. So we can measure that, come up with a resolution like this. So similarly, when we do the seismic tomography, we have to rely on the uh, source from earthquake. So here, I just want to show you one example of this seismic tomography. We can image the structure beneath the volcano. So we know volcano, we have the associated magma chamber beneath the volcano, which contains the liquid magma, right, which allow the, uh, which uh, slow down the propagation of the seismic wave. So by looking at the seismic wave travel time from the source to the receiver, we are able to tell where is the, where is the, is the location of magma. Also, we are able to estimate how much magma is stored beneath the volcano by, by using all different paths from different directions, similar to the CT scan used into medicine. So this, this is a lots of study uh, 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 done for the imaging volcano estimates the the risk of the a lot of recent studies show the site of the for the all deposit could be also related to the uh, structure of the earth especially the lithosphere structure so this uh, one nature geoscience paper uh, published by our uh, bill graving professor bill graving which shows they are the structure of the lithosphere they could uh, control the location of the big the all deposit because we know all the old metal ore deposits are related to the magma activities. And this magma are generated in the deep. They could be uh, got concentrated by the shape of the, of the lithosphere, which can also leading to the concentration of the, of the different metal ore. So image and detail the structure of the lithosphere is very important to talk, bet, talk the uh, location of the, uh, the ore deposits. And usually, when we when people do the do the imaging, we have to rely on the earthquake. So here on the top, I show you one example of the uh, earthquake distribution around the world, and each of the color represented the one of the earthquakes uh, with the magnitude here from six point zero to nine point five. So we can see all the big earthquakes are, are concentrated on the pre. Uh, boundaries mostly in the if we look at this this is the in the west the subduction zone of the Pacific plate with all uh, big earthquake mostly uh, happening there but if you look at the interior of the continent like North America and uh, Australia we don't have the mining earthquakes and uh, as I said at the beginning so traditional seismic imaging we has to rely on the earthquake source to do imaging so for areas without the coverage of the seismic activity, the imaging could be very hard because we don't have the source. We have to rely on very distant source to the image. And here, I just want to zoom in to Australia, right? So all the earthquakes in Australia are com coming in the north area of the Sumatra subduction zone, also in the subduction zone in the east, in the east of the New Zealand. Some earthquake could be in the uh, Indian Middle Ocean Ridge, but there are very few we can use to image in the uh, underlying structure beneath Australia. So we have to rely on the source, traditional earthquake based on tomography. We have to rely on the earthquake source, which is not a good ideal situation to image the uh, interior structure of the uh, Australia continent because they, they have the past has to come from the distance earthquake and the signal will become weak and weak after the seismic will propagating over the long distance, over thousands of uh, kilometers. So the seismic wave we are dealing mostly is a traditional seismic wave, we're dealing with a surface wave. So just by uh, definition, surface waves are wave propagating uh, along the shallow surface of us, mostly limited to two or 300 kilometers of the, uh, uh, of the shell of surface. So it's really ideal to image the uh, lithosphere structure. And also surface wave have very strong amplitude and it is also responding for the damaging seismic wave to the from earthquakes. So most of the very destructive surface wave. 
all the uh, damage mostly come from the surface wave or, or, or we also or for the shear wave also. And uh, in about 10, about 10 or 15 years ago, there's a new tech uh, methodology we call ambient noise tomography uh, emerged, which can replace the earthquake signal to, to have the signal just the generated from the ambient noise. So this uh, methodology uh, emerged when I was supposed to in the United States about uh, 15 years ago. So I start to work on this. We try to using the, we call the ambient noise. We try to extract the seismic wave, not from a speak. So in this methodology, the, the, if we have the two seismic receiver, because we can receive the, all the background motion from all different kinds of the uh, tiny ground motion, which can be generated by the ocean wave. So we are able to using long period of the noise and do some technique we call cross correlation. We are able to generate a similar surface wave as really surface wave from earthquake. And use that, we, are, we, we can uh, do imaging without relying on the source from earthquake. So which is a very ide I ideal for imaging in in uh, con continent of South Australia. So here, just for the comparison, at the beginning I introduced the traditional seismic imaging methodology, which has to using wave coming from mostly from source to receiver. So we measure the travel time, we can get a velocity. But now we are able to get a similar surface wave uh, from just a uh, pair of the stations. So if we have the bunch of the uh, seismic receiver in that area, we can just uh, gener generate the uh, wave propagate, propagating between the stations. Then we are able to uh, get the in uh, seismic velocity information. And with the seismic velocity information, it, we can do the tomography and then we are able to identify the different uh, velocity features associated different uh, structures. Just as a show one example for the subduction oceanic slab, high, high velocity slab. So people must wonder why is the ambient noise comes from. So as I mentioned earlier briefly, a lot of the seismic noise come from the ocean, come from the interaction of the ocean wave with the coastal lines. When the ocean wave hits the the coastline, the energy, the movement of wave can convert it to can convert it into seismic wave, which can propagate over very long distance, over like several thousand kilometers. Even it can propagate into the interior of the con uh, Australian continent. So this is a kind of the long period surface wave. If we look at this, here is to show you the uh, it's horizontal axis. We show the period the period of the seismic wave. And there's also very high frequency wave at the frequency higher one hertz, which are mostly generated by the human activities, like uh, mostly like a truck, a car, we driving or, or train, which also generates a very noise uh, signals. So different period, the source could be different. And uh, one example, during this uh, COVID-19 lockdown, a lot of uh, uh, seismologists uh, actually looking at the noise at this uh, high frequency part. They try to analyze if the, this uh, noise are related to the, how it relates to the traffic control uh, up to, uh, under the lockdown. So this is one example done by uh, some seismologist, uh, seismologist, Stephen Hicks from Imperial College of London. They analyze the seismic energy from the seismic station across the United Kingdom. And uh, this is uh, show you the energy level of the noise uh, movement. There's a two different uh, array, which both show there's a big change of the, of the seismic energy associated with the government's lockdown announcement in the late uh, March. So we can see clearly this uh, big drop of the uh, background noise. Uh, really relates to lockdown. And uh, so uh, this similar study are done by different uh, seismologists across different countries like Italy, China, they did a similar study. They all find uh, this uh, big drop of the ambient noise, background noise 
So a lot of people say, oh, we can use this methodology to, to monitoring how effective the lockdown measures taken by the government by compare the change of the, uh, of the noise. Also, there are some, I just uh, saw some paper come out, people try also using this analyze the assessment level to compare the GDP growth because they provide in, uh, uh, additional information how this relate to the growth of GDP, mostly relate to the, uh, the number of the uh, activity of the tra transportation relate to the economic activities. So with this uh, information, which here we want to try, try to see how we can uh, Get the surface wave from ambient noise. So, in the next few slides, I want to briefly introduce the methodology, the physical principle behind this method, and uh, we can how we can extract the wave between uh, any two stations. So here I just show you one example: two station with uh, 400 kilometers apart, and uh, we can simulate the the noise, the very tiny noise. Actually, the movements from one single noise is very, very small, and we cannot see clearly. But here, we just want to simulate this noise. So way one, we can, one noise, we can see the tiny movement in the seismometer, we call the receiver. This is one source. If we add another one source randomly, we can see two peaks from this source. And for this situation, we don't see any the correlation between this a source, we don't see any good pattern. But if we move the two source to the great circle path connected by this station one and the station two, we can see the for source A and the source B, the, the differential time, which time for A propagate for receiver two and the receiver one, the difference time is about 130 seconds. They are same for source A and the source B. So if we have a lot of source in this area, they have the same differential time. And with this differential time, we can using the mathematical uh, method we call cross correlation. We are able to find this time difference. So if we do the cross correlation, which equivalent to the move, move shift the uh, recording from one station to another station, we can align this uh, source with a similar the differential arrival time. So we can find the differential time between these two this stations, which is about 130 seconds for this case. Then this is a, this signal, 130 seconds. So with this travel time, 130 seconds, if equivalent to we, we drive our car from the receiver two to receiver one. So we know the distance between the station one, station two. We know our travel time. So we can estimate the velocity behind, beneath the, uh, for the structure, for the material beneath the station one and the station two. And uh, in principle, we, we have the, all different kinds of noise. As I said, this noise can, from, can come from all different kinds of sources, from the ocean wave, from the atmosphere stone, and, uh, and uh, from the human activity. So, so if we look at individual recording, we don't see much uh, useful information. We just uh, see the random wiggle, different source from the different tiny, tiny the ambient noise source. But if we do this uh, cross correlation, and instantly we are able to uh, get the differential travel time for this station to that station, we see for cycle wave propagating between these two stations gave us the information about the velocity between these two stations. So we can directly measure the, the travel time. So here, I want to show you one example, real case, we do the cross correlation between one station located in the Colorado here with all the rest of the, tri the triangles. This is, the, the, this is the, the, the seismic station deployed across the uh, America. We can see this very clear seismic wave propagating away from this uh, station to other stations. And uh, we can see from this movie, and if we show the movie, we, we put plot this uh, wave as a, as a seismic wave propagation from that source. So this is uh, just equivalent to an earthquake happening here, and the seismic wave propagating away from the location of the epicenter of the earthquake to put the rest of the stations. Then, with this 
a lot of the siphon stations, we are able to get uh, the, all this uh, information. Then we can do imaging, uh, uh, map the underlying structure beneath the area covered by the stations. So with this background, I want to now start to show you some applications of IAM methodology to image surface structure. So first application I want to show you is for the try to find the hidden fault in cities. As we know, there's a different kinds of faults on, in the uh, shallow uh, crust. We here just show you the three uh, typical uh, type of fault, refers normal and a strike fault. So with this fault, there's always the relative movement uh, between the different, uh, between the two blocks of this uh, fault. And uh, for a lot of big fault, we can direct absorb on the surface because there's a relative movement. However, for some fault uh, in the sediment, uh, sediment field area, the fault line could be uh, could be buried and uh, we don't see much information on the surface because it's all filled up by the sediment layers. So by imaging this structure of using aminoids, we are able to tell where is the exact location of the fault. So here, and also if we don't know the fault, if we uh, construct the buildings on the fault line, it could uh, introduce uh, damage to, to the uh, houses, especially for the high-rise buildings. So here I want to show you some example for the house built on the uh, St. Andrews 4. This, so here everyone knows this is a St. Andrews the big four cut through the California. And in addition to that, they have a lot of the small, small forts also. And uh, one particular example I want to show you here is the for a fault line, fault line, <coughs> for this uh, particular it's called Caravers fault line. There's a town called Hollis, which actually is the seat right on the top of the fault line. So in the bottom vig, where I show you this fault line goes through the goes through the, uh, the the town actually. And if we look at one example of the one example of this uh, house for this uh, this uh, number of the five streets five hundred fifty. This is uh, this house. The people took a picture of the different years, and this is a picture taken in 192, and this is 2018. And by looking at the looking at the picture, we can see clearly, clearly there is a big deformation between the difference between these two houses, because there is the sitting right on top of the fault line, and this fault line is moved relatively to each other with, uh, with the magnitude of se several centimeters each year. And uh, this house is um, badly deformed. Also, for a house sitting on the fault line, whenever there's earthquake happening in the surrounding area, the damage could be large because uh, there's always a relative movement between the, uh, on both sides of the fault line. So we try to avoid the uh, construct anything about right above the uh, the fault line or in the area close to the fault line, especially for high-rise buildings. So by collabor collaborating my the collaborator in China, Professor Loinger from China University of Science Wuhan, we did some pilot study in Shanghai, in the south of Shanghai. So the purpose of the project is to try to identify the hidden fault line in the in suburbs of the Shanghai, and uh, so this is a this each of the uh, pin here is show the location of the our our uh, station. So we can collect the source. We are able to the, most of source for this study coming from actually the human activities because we are looking at a very high frequency signal. We are using the signal looking at a shallow surface uh, structure, which is uh, here is a top two kilometer, and. Uh, this, the button fix show us the, the uh, imaging result, mostly show you the seismic velocity associated with the different layers, with the lower velocity on the top, which associated with the soil layer. And uh, we can see seismic velocity increase gradually with the depth. And uh, from like uh, point, point 0.3 km per, kilometer per second to like three or 2.5 kilometer per second. Also along the line, we see two, 
section with very big uh, change the discontinuity, which we think is the directly related to the fault lines here with about over this, uh, this is uh, totally, this is about uh, four or five kilometers uh, long along this line. We have, we see the two, uh, two hidden faults. And, but on the surface, we didn't see any offset because it's all the field by the sediments. So this is just the, uh, and actually the location of fault is already, or they, when we do the, when we uh, operate the project, the, the location for the hidden fault is already known, but the contract, they, they didn't tell me, tell us, they want to test our methodology works or not for these kinds of project. So with this is successful, a lot of study, similar uh, study has been carried out in China across different uh, cities, because we know China is an earthquake prone country. A lot of cities are building some, in some area with a high risk of the earthquake hazard. So it's important to carry out the uh, imaging to locate all these uh, hidden fault. And the second case study is related to the uh, find the uh, geothermal reservoir. And this project is, is done in the cities in very close to in the central part of China. So here I want to show you the location of the uh, project we did. This is the uh, Yangtze River. And uh, here is uh, this is uh, some areas, uh, the location of uh, Changjiang Three Gorges. And uh, Wuhan is about here. So with this uh, configuration, this uh, study area is located right beneath the, in the uh, mountain flanks with the lower elevation in the west of the mountains. So this kinds of geothermal reservoir is created by the uh, difference of elevation with so, uh, precipitation seep into the fractures on the mountains, then can go deep and uh, get uh, warmed up by the, by the basement and the, then the hot water come up in some area from the fractures in the lower lying the areas. So we, we did some uh, experiments in some area with, uh, with hot water seepling through the, uh, 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 through the deep. And there's the hot water everywhere, but we are not exactly sure where is, is, uh, is the water comes from, where exactly the, the pathway. So by deploying the similar the array as we did in Shanghai, we also get the velocity structure showing on the top right here. And similarly, we see very short, very low velocity on the surface associated with the uh, uh, soil layers. Then we, all, then we see this uh, low velocity uh, um, column, which, is, uh, which we think is the must related to this uh, pathway for the hot waters, because hot waters must come from the fractures. And the fractures with, with fractures is, uh, is, is, has led to the lower seismic velocity. So after we give the picture, the, the government uh, drew a, a, a hole, a well down there, they can finally found they, they can have the water like temperature like 60 degree when we drill down about one, 1.3 or 1.5 kilometer down the area, get very hot waters. So the purpose for this, they try to develop this uh, uh, hot water into the hot spring resort. And, and we did a similar project in China. This is just for the small scale the application. Uh, we, I did also some large scale uh, geothermal exploration, try to understand the source of the geothermal. One of the projects I did when about 10 years ago when I was in the United States is for the coastal geothermal field. field. So there's the coastal geothermal field located in the uh, east of the California. This is a picture of the coastal, coastal geothermal field operating with the, with the hot water from the underground. I, and uh, even though the, the plan operated for a long period of time, but they, uh, we are still not sure where is the source of the, the, the hot water. So we tried to uh, image the underlying structure beneath this um, uh, thermal power plant, and we carried out this imaging using a, a seismic array there. This is the result we got. And we, in the area 
for close to the coastal geothermal field here, we see very low seismic velocity. And if we look, if we want to look at the cross section, we can see this is a location of the <coughs> coastal geothermal field. We see very low seismic velocity at the shallow depths, uh, about one or two kilometers. Also, at a great depth about the six kilometers, we see larger scale low velocity low velocity channels there. So we thought by analyzing the, the geometry of the low velocity, we saw this deep low velocity must be the source for this all the heat. And the, the top is just the hydrothermal, the pathway from the heat from the deep uh, depths. And the reason for that, when we look at the large scale low velocity area outlined here, this is a, all this the red air indicates the low velocity, which associated very well with the, the volcanic rocks we observed on the surface. This is a very, uh, a lot of them are the quaternary volcanic rocks. And so we suspect this low velocity is uh, delineates the very well the, the some present of the magmas in the, in the uh, uh, depths about six kilometers uh, uh, area, which corresponded the, the original of the heat source for the coastal geothermal field. And so similar work actually uh, have to be carried out in different areas, especially in China. The China, I know a lot of my friends are are working on the similar project. They try to evaluate the potential for the geothermal the exploration in the future. They can estimate the temperature based on the seismic velocity and they can find the, the location for the uh, development of these kinds of renewable energy in the future. And so this is a relate to the very shallow structure. Another project uh, we did in the past uh, few years is uh, done my PhD student Guo Liang Li is uh, try to map in the sediment basin uh, using the seismic wave. And this image and structure of the sediment, sediment basin is, could be have the uh, uh, very important uh, role played in the exploration of the oil and the gas reservoir. And also the detailed structure of sediment layer is important for the uh, mitigated seismic hazard as uh, show this, uh, as showed by this, uh, movie, we can say when seismic wave, wave propagate all the different areas, when the seismic wave propagating the area with the soil, the very deep of the sediments, the ground motion can be amplified by several times, which could lead to collapse of buildings. So here, <coughs> just to show you the one, three signals here, the, this is a signal passing the solid bed area with a solid bed rock. And this, this is for the uh, wave passing through the uh, solidified sediments, also for area with the very, very unsolidified sediments. This have much big amplitude uh, ground motion. So it's important to delineate the thickness of the sediment layers, especially for the earthquake prone areas. And uh, another uh, uh, important thing about the image of the sediment layer is we try to uh, understand uh, underlying structure. As we know, Australia is a, is a mining country and uh, most of mine uh, find some area with uh, direct outcrops of rocks, but 70% of Australia continent are covered by sediments. And we don't know much about the structure beneath the sediments if we, uh, so far. So first step in order to explore the the possible so, uh, mineral source beneath the, the sediment layer, we have to understand the thickness of the structure of the sediment layers. And uh, so we did a project uh, using the seismic uh, station deployed in the uh, Victoria, also part of, in the south part of, of the New South Wales. We call this uh, array is called the Wombat Array, uh, actually deployed by the ANU seismologist represent one of the largest uh, seismic array in the South Hemisphere. And uh, using this array, and uh, we are able to, which, uh, able to image the, uh, the thickness of the sediment layers across these areas, uh, stretching from the Adelaide Fault Belt and the Murray Basin on the Lachlan Orange of the, also the Sydney Basin. So here, Sydney is about here. 
And this is a result of the seismic velocity at 250 meters. And if we look at them, the uh, red color indi uh, indicated low velocity, we can see it's associated very well with the, with the basin, especially the Murray Basin. We can see the, the boundary clearly between this high velocity in the mount, mount, mountain areas, uh, the Adelaide Field Bell, and this is the Murray Basin. Very big contrast of seismic velocity associated with uh, uh, low velocity associated with the sediments. And beneath the Sydney Basin, we also see the low velocities. And if we look at the cross section, we can see more clearly with the thickness of the sediment layers. We have the very thick sediment layer beneath the Sydney Basin with about two uh, kilometer sediment rocks. And uh, beneath the Murray Basin is about one kilometer. Also the seismic velocity are very different actually. Sediment Murray Basin sediment velocity is lower compared to the Sydney Basin, probably the Sydney Basin is older basin. So most of the sediments already become the sediment rocks, sand rock here. And the two, so we also need to verify the, our uh, results uh, compared with the thickness we got uh, uh, from the, our method with the, the drill hole. So drill hole gives us the ground truth information. We, we compare the differences on order of the several tens of meters, so some of them are one or 200 kilometer uh, difference. It's very quite accurate, actually, compare other, uh, other methods. So using aminoids give us quite good estimate of the, uh, the, uh, the basement uh, depths. So using this information is very important, especially for the uh, evaluated assessment hazard in the area. You, of course, we don't have the much earthquake height in Australia, but it, it has the big implication for the areas sitting in the sediment layers with like uh, Los Angeles. They are have the San Angeles fall. We have the potential for uh, destructive earthquake. And uh, by, so currently uh, my uh, postdoc Wang Kai is working on trying to ex expand this method to the whole continent of Australia. This is uh, a funny the DP project, we try to use ambient noise to uh, refine the uh, underlying uh, structure beneath the Australian continent using the, all the available seismic array. We try to look at a uh, structure into deeper, into like 200 kilometers. Uh, because all the continental model uh, built before is all rely on this uh, earthquake, the distant earthquake from the subduction area. So within this ambient noise, we try to using seismic uh, array within the continent and have the better imaging, better resolution of the, our continent, which can help us to uh, uh, improve the targeting of the uh, mineral deposit in the future. Okay, so another application I wanna show you is for the, done by my uh, former PhD student for the, uh, try to understand the mountain building for the Tibet Plateau. So we know, as I mentioned earlier, plateau, the Tibet Plateau is a uh, very broad. North South is about 200, about 2000 kilometers and uh, East the West uh, 4000 kilometers. So the, the first odd <coughs> mechanism for the generating the plateau, we all know is the, due to the collision between India and the Eurasian, Eurasian plates. But how the collision can create a such broad plateau also why the plateau is uh, so flat? We're not sure, we don't know exactly. And there's a model that people call the low crustal channel flow model. They propose when the collision happens, this when the crust can become thick and the thick wind cluster become thicker, the middle cluster can uh, become weak. And then this weak layer, they can flow uh, towards the uh, edge of the plateau. So this creates this blood of the blood of the Tibet Plateau. But there's no much uh, evidence for the low, weak layer in the middle uh, crust. So using our ambient noise, we are able to collect all the seismic data from about 600 stations scattering around the plateau and the surrounding areas. We can uh, retrieve all the surface wave from the stations and do the imaging. And this is show you the velocity imaging. There's a very shallow depth of the five kilometers. We see the low velocity again associated with sediment layers. Also, we see the low velocity in the middle crust. 
if we look at this, all the red areas in the uh, beneath the Tibet, and this in the surrounding area, this is a high, very high velocity. This is Sichuan Basin and the Tarui Basin. And then this velocity we can see is a go beneath this area. And uh, we, if we look at the cross section uh, from the surface to the uh, 100 kilometers, we can see the middle cross, they are always the red zone, indicates the lower velocity. It could be a uh, reflector of the reflective of this uh, low, weak, low velocity and a weak middle cross the layer. And then if we look at the, the, the boundary of the Tibet Plateau here, this is the Quenren Fault, it's presumed the north boundary of the plateau. We can, we can see this uh, low velocity channel, this which goes through the uh, Quenren Fault in the north side. So which could be in, uh, 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 which could be the evidence for the, the lower crustal channel flow based on the seismic imaging provide evidence this is a low cross of, uh, channel flow could be the model for the uh, generation of this uh, broad the plateau. So this is a, this is a, uh, a field example is the most sure of the application for the seismic imaging by looking at structures. Actually the ambient noise could have the different application also. We can use in the ambient noise to look at the media change because if we have the two seismic station, we are able to absorb the seismic travel time between the two stations over different times. So we can, if there's any change of media during the different period, we can measure the, uh, measure the difference travel time between the, uh, between the medias at different times. So we can compare the, this uh, waveform here, show the construction at a different time. We can measure the travel time difference then we can measure the difference in terms of velocity. And we, we, we know if there are any change of the uh, media, underlying media here. So one application for this modeling can, do, can look at uh, the change of the ground water level. So this is study not done by, by my research group, actually it's by, done by a seismologist in Harvard University. They look at the ground water level in California. So here is a, you, they're using a bunch of seismic station. This uh, triangle show the location of seismic station. They can draw the cross correlation, get a wide, measure the travel time between the, between the station. They can measure the travel time at a different time. Then they can compare the, the, <coughs> the ground, uh, ground water level. So here is a show you the comparison during two, uh, in, January 2005 to the January, uh, June 2005, following a large precipitation event. So there's a lot of uh, rain water going into the ground. And uh, here we observe the uh, velocity, uh, velocity decrease during that period because the recent velocity decreases because there's uh, more water on the, in the underground. So the water will decrease the seismic velocity. We are able, detect the uh, velocity uh, reduction with the uh, increase of groundwater level. And uh, in, dur during 2012 to 2017, during the California drought, they see the big velocity uh, increase. It's in red color associated with the uh, uh, drop of the groundwater level. So groundwater level actually uh, from the different to the uh, uh, drilling wells. So this show very good uh, correlation between seismic velocity or uh, change over these uh, uh, different years. And, and uh, the last peak of the, their study show very good correlation. So here is the, the line, the, the black line show the seismic velocity change. And the, the up direction indicate the velocity reduction and the, the <coughs> associated very well the, uh, the level of the groundwater indicate this, uh, the blue lines, very good correlation for here. So similar work we can be applied to Australia probably in to monitoring the groundwater level. I, from what I know, there's already some work underway in the West Australia. They try to monitoring this uh, groundwater using similar methodology. So last example I wanna show you is the people also working on the try to using the seismic noise to monitoring the structure health of the large buildings like the Shanghai Tower. This 
pilot project is done by my former postdoc Guo Zhen. He's in the he's now a assistant professor in the uh, Southern Technology uh, University Technology of the uh, in Shenzhen. So they install a uh, uh, a lot of the receiver like this we call the dual phone in different levels. The Shanghai Tower, you know, the Shanghai Tower is second second tallest building in the world with uh, 128 stories, uh, six, over 600 meters, over 600 meters. So they can measure the seismic wave propagating in, within the, the, the buildings and they can measure the velocity at a different time propagating at a different uh, levels. So here I just show you the example of the velocity reduction. So similar on the up direction, they show the velocity reduction and uh, this is in the downward direction. And by looking at the velocity, they can see clearly the dash line indicated the 11 o'clock in the midnight. And uh, after midnight, they see the overall velocity increase up to the early morning before the sunrise. Then when sunrise comes about six or seven o'clock, the velocity start to decrease, reach the, the maximum the velocity reduction at, in the afternoon. So by looking at this, we can clearly uh, get a conclusion. This uh, velocity reduction is related to the temperature because when temperature increase, the, the rigidity of the rigidity of the building material become slight, a little, uh, slightly weaker, leading to the lower seismic velocity. And if we can deploy the, this uh, uh, <laughs> sensor, we are can we can monitoring the a uh, long-term variation of the building. So if anything happened to, if any crack appears in the, inside the buildings, we should be able to see the, the reduction. So it's long-term monitoring of the high-rise building could it be uh, useful based on the seismic ambient noise of like this. Okay, so this is all my talk. So to summarize quickly, and the uh, ambient noise is a very useful, the techniques we can, do the all kinds of skills imaging, looking at shallow depths. Also, we can look at the very deep depths up to lithosphere scale, and uh, it uh, provide us some methodology without relying on earthquake in the imaging. Thank you. In the example of Shanghai, the model seems very smooth. Is that done on purpose, or what's the concern here in showing a busy model? In the case of the Shanghai building, the Shanghai Tower actually we mostly monitoring the change of the velocity. So we just measure the velocity at a different time and we plot the change the here is, the, is over different hours. It's about the fourth line, this one. Yeah, this one. Why, why, why does it look um, so smooth? So, okay, yeah, I got the question. The, the reason, so the imaging we got is always so quite a smooth because the, it all depends on the <laughs> density of the state receiver. So we are, we cannot go to find the very, very sharp, the uh, sharp, the uh, fault line. It's mostly is is uh, limited by the by the the location of the uh, location and the number of the receivers. So with the current uh, uh, current the uh, configuration of the receivers we can only get a smooth uh, change of the velocity. In monitoring the water ground level, is temporal variation in the ambient noise source distribution a problem or is the effect small? So yeah, there's the problem of the distribution of source, but that is uh, compare the change, the, compare the strength of the change. This is uh, the change signal is uh, bigger than the change of the uh, change of the source of the noise because this is we can also have some because that work is not done by myself so the detail is really hard to see but I can refer that uh, person to the paper I, I show the link for that paper in the slides so probably you can look into that paper they must have some section answering that uh, question relates to the source distribution, how is the source distribution affect the resulting velocity variations? You should request a meeting with the NSW government to explain this method to control the quality and deterioration of important buildings. Um, I see a big linkage there. Yes, yeah, so probably if we 
I need to first to find <laughs> some connection with this. We give a talk to them. I have the yeah. Actually, in that work of Shanghai Tower, the my post uh he present capture all different kinds of emission. In addition to this velocity variation, they provide also some other information about the uh, uh, different the motion at the different levels, and uh, they can identify the weak. Uh, uh, they call the weak section where is the have the biggest uh, uh, movement. So when air sounds don't have the big movement, it could mean the uh, uh, the concentration of the stress, which is uh, important in the future to monitoring. Why does increasing the water table reduce the seismic velocity? This is quite counterintuitive since saturated material has a higher velocity than dry material. When the when the water level goes up, overall is is um, it will decrease, right? All the based on the all the uh, lab experiments, when we have the piece of rock, if we have the uh, wet wet the rocks, the saturated velocity will be decreased because yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's related to the yeah physically yeah, and it should, must be related to related to the rigidity of the like the shearing with the water the shearing probably the the shearing be, between the rocks will be a little bit uh, a little a little bit smooth, so make the shearing less less uh, easy. Just similar as as uh, all the like serpentine, the rocks of serpentine with the water is become a little bit uh, make the shearing between the uh, particle uh, a little bit less easy. So slower the propagation of such velocity. Uh, well, I, I was late, so but then you were showing this slide, so I'm very interested in this one, and then uh, on which you claim you found the probably two faults. What what were the scales of the array? Oh, for which uh, which array? Yeah, right. Exactly the slide you are showing. The slides are in oh we. So this is the uh, length about a fourth of about five kilometers. Five kilometer, and where where is it? Uh, it's uh, in north side of the Shanghai. So this work is uh, done by uh, Luo Yinghe actually. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, then it may not be necessarily to be the fault, I guess, for that two low velocities because there were no, you know, if you have a such such scale of low velocity zones, then. Um, you know, the faults should be more profound. But then in Shanghai, do we have that kind of a that relatively large scale fault? Uh, actually, yes, because uh, when we, before we, actually the people ask us to this, do this kind of project, they already know there's a fault line in that area. So oh. they just want us to do this kind of research and test if their, our method can work or not. So, but we don't know. They didn't tell us when we when we did this project. Mm, okay. I think they they have the information based on other other methodology or or just the, because this is about uh, one kilometer deep, I think. So they have the they already have some juho or other information. Yeah, about the details, I I don't know. But based on what I communicated with Sir Luo Yinghe, he said that. Uh, they already told, they already knew that. The location of the fault line, the hidden fault line already here. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, so um, stay tuned. The next seminar will be in two weeks because next week there are the MHDR talks. So thanks everyone for coming and bye-bye.